Fauna. Dreaming of Words and Lilies. Curtain Call. There are some incidents in life that you cannot describe, not because you weren't there, but because you do not have a conscious memory of them. The day you were born is obviously one. You have to believe what you were told about the details, and if you persist, you may learn a little more, whether it was a sunny day or it rained like hell, which would have been a cooling respite if you were coming in from purgatory. Outside of those early years, however, there are other experiences that you may feel quite confident in recalling from your own personal memory. Some of these experiences, however, can arguably be considered as mere speculation. It is also sobering to think that while you recognize your accomplishments as great feats, the rest of the world probably paid very little attention. It gives you a feeling that probably no one else will ever remember it that way. Or is it that looking too far back is simply an exercise in egocentric self-gratification? In his book on what early childhood memories say about you, Kevin Lehman makes an interesting claim. He suggests that such memories are really priceless glimpses beyond all the facades and defenses straight into the core of who that person is. For those who read memories, they can most likely find a master key that unlocks all sorts of entities into what makes that person tick. Well, I have not published many scholarly articles, but I've had the opportunity to write endless reports in consultancies to different actors while they were on the stage of passion and economic policies. This collection is more about the content of those reports and what they could have meant in the struggle against poverty and underdevelopment. If you really feel you can decipher some cathartic expression of what made me think then, well, I would admit in my own words that you must be very good at what you do. My name is Alan Nathaniel Williams. I was born in the colony of British Guiana. At that time, it was known simply as BG. The mighty sparrow, forever known as the King of Calypso, once memorialized the place in a popular melody. I don't care if the whole of BG burned down. I don't care if the whole of Georgetown burned down. But you'll be putting me out my way if you only touch Tiger Bay and burn down the hotel where all me wabin does stay. Oh, those lyrics bring back memories. But they are not the ones of fondness for a colonial upbringing. Rather, they set the stage for a drama of struggle, fire in the place, riots, chaos, and total confusion in life. The story I'm about to tell is best presented on the stage of struggle, a mode of living in which you are constantly striving to achieve something much greater than yourself. I'm not talking here about a career status or owning the material things of middle class life. I'm talking about a vision of a world that, if I had designer's privilege, I would have chosen as a preferable replacement to this current one. Paro's lyrics also portray a hidden reality about such dreams. Bandung everything but leave my peace alone. That is not really me. That is the ploy of the antagonist trying to take center stage against the unspoken heroes of struggle. Colonial British Guiana I was born in Georgetown, British Guiana, a true legacy of British colonialism in the West Indies. It was in the year of 1946, and I was the last of three children to Lillian Princess Green and Clement Allen Williams. My mother was a hard-working dressmaker, and my father was a trained chemist and druggist. That's what they called persons working in the pharmacy in those days. I don't think he was cut out for that role, as he later studied to become a registered accountant, ACCA, and worked for the better part of his life in BG at Booker's Limited. 
One of the reasons for exploring my early childhood was to see if I can give credence to any notion that the physical space of my early childhood may have influenced my personal development. But then, these are selective recollections of the milestones of my childhood development. Even if they were representative of early influences, they will surely differ from the observations and even the expectations of my parents who were actually present on the scene. Well, not at all of the scenes. I cannot brag of a rag to riches story. I was not born into a poor family, nor brought up in a rural community, schooled by missionaries, and pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, even though I did wear shoes all my life. I remember Ivan van Sertima, the author of the famous work, They Came Before Columbus, pointing out that he grew up in a forest in Guiana, and how that early beginning gave him such great tools with which to understand his world later on. Ivan would claim that it was in the forest that he learned to distinguish between different sounds and thought that his hearing capability was superb. From swimming in rivers, he developed a profound understanding of underwater currents that easily convinced him that Africans could have reached the Americas by simply using the transatlantic currents off the coast of Africa to South America and the Caribbean. I can make no such claim as to my early life experiences. Holded by physical space Most of the early memories of my physical space were three places. The first was Kitty Village, which was the first village you would encounter traveling out of Georgetown going east along the coastal road. The only interesting thing here was my primary education, which I will deal with later on. The second place was the town of Bartica, on the junction of the Mazaruni and Cuyuni rivers, where these two joined the great Essequibo River. As children, this was our vacation getaway, with great aunts on my mother's side, the barns. Their house was a little way from the town itself, and was actually on the bank of the Essequibo River. Although it never overflowed its banks while I was there, still it was fascinating to see this river rise to within inches of reaching the shoreline. I never quite fathomed where all this water was coming from, but at this point it appeared to be a slow moving river on the surface, although we were warned that the currents below were fierce. The third space was on the Pomeroon River. This was at the property of a great aunt of my dad, Aunt Mary, the Brackets. They had built a home on the Pomeroon River between the settlements of Charity and Jack Lowe. Looking back, these folks must have been well off to be willing to take two kids for the August holiday, my sister and myself, 10 and 8 years respectively. Besides their estate, the Brackets had two dry goods stores in the area store in the market in the town of Charity, which was as far as the road along the west coast of the Esquivel River reached. Then they had the major dry goods store up the river close to Jacklo. This was only accessible by canoe. My memories of the folks in that region were mostly Amerindians, indigenous people, with a few of East Indian and African descent. Rivers in Guyana Guyana is a land of many rivers, but in my early memories, I was only conscious of three. The first was the Demara River that rises in the forests of central Guyana and flows northward without any important tributaries for 215 miles, 346 kilometers, to the Atlantic Ocean at Georgetown. The Demara has two small islands upstream from its estuary. Its narrow estuary and rapid flow to the ocean kept clear a clear channel of 16 to 20 feet, 5 to 6 meters. This meant that ocean going steamers needed to reach as far as 6 to 5 miles up this river to the bauxite town of Mackenzie. This town was later renamed Linden in honor of President Linden Forbes Sampson Burnham. The Esequibo River is the largest river in Guyana rising in the Akarai Mountains near the Brazil-Guyana border. 
Yesik River flows to the north for 1,014 kilometers, 630 miles, through forests and savannas before emptying into the Atlantic Ocean. The Sikriva River has many large islands at its estuary, and because of this, the depth of the channels at the mouth of the river varies significantly. At one end, the water reaches a depth of 100 feet, while at the other, it's only 50 feet deep. You have to know how to navigate this river. The river of my memories, however, is the Pomeroon River, and its memories are vivid. First of all, the Pomeroon defines a region with a history of indigenous occupation. The area had long been inhabited mostly by the Lokono and the Kalin people. The Pomeroon River is one of the deepest rivers in Guyana. Like all of our rivers, the Pomeroon River does eventually empty into the Atlantic Ocean. But unlike the others, you cannot access it from its estuary. At its mouth, the river deteriorates into a series of mangrove swamp vegetation. The only way to get to the Pomeroon in our day was to go by road to the village called Charity, and this was a trip itself worthy of mention. The river is unrepresentative of rivers in Guyana in many other ways. Not only is it the deepest river, it possesses no sandbanks, no islands, and unlike the Barima, Waini, which discharge their waters into the Atlantic Ocean in a northeasterly direction, this 200 odd mile river discharges its waters into the Atlantic in a westerly direction. Before you ascribe to me any feat of genius in the environmental uniqueness of our riparian scenarios, let me confess that my knowledge of rivers in Guyana is not childhood knowledge. I looked it up on Google before coming here and selling it to you. Well, not quite all of them. Most of the ferry crossings in BG were done in flat bottom boats because the rivers were not deep. I never knew this until I took a trip from Kingston, St. Vincent to the island of Becquia by ferry and it was the worst boat ride I had ever endured. Complaining to the boat operator under the pretext that he was a very poor sailor, he advised me that the boat had been bought in Guyana where they use flat bottom boats. However, such boats are usually very difficult to control in the Caribbean Sea. Where did you say you were from? And you didn't know that? August holiday in the Pamaroon. Just getting to the Pomeroon River was an adventure in itself. If you were coming from Georgetown, you would first need to cross the Lamara River by ferry, then take a train from Bridenhu to Parika on the Essex River. Then you would have to take a second ferry to a place called Adventure, which is the landing stop on the other side of the Essex River. Then comes the ride of your life in a great old bus speeding down a set of dirt roads that ran from Suddy on the Scriba coast to Charity on the Pomeroon River. One of the joys of this section of the trip was the names of the communities through which you had to pass. There were Good Hope, Fear Not, Better Hope, Better Success, Reliance, Anna Georgina, Golden Fleece, Spring Gardens, and finally, Charity. I'm not kidding you. You almost got the feeling that whoever named these villages was really trying to show, quote, either an awful reality about the conditions of the roads or the remoteness of your ultimate destination. There are other things that I remember about the Palm Road. For instance, Uncle had a coffee house where he ground his coffee beans. The order of this operation was so overwhelming that I later appreciated how people became addicted to coffee. I was never really enticed later on in life to take up drinking coffee. Maybe in all my bitterness towards British colonialism, I failed to shake off the craven desire for tea and crumpets. Uncle used to have one warning. Never sit on a log because it could be actually a snake. 
I was to witness a huge anaconda snake on the bank of the river, using the daylight out of a chicken. Go set me for a shotgun, but while I was looking in awe at the chicken fluttering and crowing, Uncle was pointing his gun in another direction. Then a shot went off in the water, and suddenly the snake relaxed its grip. Uncle had shot it in the head, but the head was in the water and nowhere close to where I was looking. Me, sitting on logs, only if I can see both ends of the log, and even then, maybe. The story almost jumped out. The most vivid memory of that vacation, however, was Sunday worship down at Charity. Now Aunt Mary was an ardent follower of the Pilgrim Holiness Church. The church was located in Charity, so on Sundays, we all got into a larger boat and motored down to Charity for Sunday service. The pastor's name was Heliger, and I believe he had about eight children. Aunt Mary had a constant complaint that all of her money for the collection was only encouraging the pastor to make more children. To quote her, all them one one picnic him still happen? Ironically, 20 years later, when I was part of a program at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, the organizers were excited to introduce me to this young new doctor who was from Guyana. He was about 26 years old. We went to a barbecue at his home, and as I told him that I was from Kitty, he said, well, you would not know me because I am from the Pomeroon. My interest picked up. What part of the Pomeroon? A little village called Charity was his reply. In the enthusiasm of bonding with my fellow countrymen, I started my story about Aunt Mary going to the Pilgrim Holiness Church in Charity. Fortunately, before I was about to give my version of her opinion of the pastor, her collection, and his many children, he said, yes, that was my father's church. Now he was getting excited to have found common ground, but I had suddenly gone silent. He said, my father always used to complain about how Miss Brackett was always complaining about the collection. All I could do was to remain silent and be thankful that my words did not expose me as growing up to become a middle-class bigot. On the other hand, young Hellinger was enthusiastic about the fact that I had recognized his father's church. With modest decorum, I concurred, yep, that is her. Unlike Van Sertima, growing up in rivers in Guyana taught me that words should not flow from your mouth like the river, aimlessly going into a predetermined destiny. I learned how and when to keep my mouth shut and to listen, lest I embarrass myself with stories of my past. Dean Heliger's son become a medical doctor was my first inkling into a reality that said, social progress out of our colonial past was not an infrequent occurrence. Education for living One of the correct policies directed at decolonization in my days was that of universal public education. In the early stages of internal self-government, the governing structure ranged from crown colony government to internal self-government. Most of these administrations devoted a significant part of their annual budget to public education. We mused the sparrows singing, Dan is the man in the van, and how he saved himself from becoming a damn fool by not learning the things they taught him in school. There is no doubt that the early education system in the British West Indies, and for that matter in all colonial structures, was geared at creating within its loyal subjects a passion for the values of the colonizer. We have heard all sorts of compliments showered on the policy of universal public education, at least at the primary level, as part of creating a literal population that can participate in elections. But there was another side to Sparrow's condemnation. I remember once being part of a program in which our NGO called ACT had brought Paulo Freire to the Castlebus Cooperative in Dominica. 
to do a literacy awareness session with a group of active villagers. Paulo Freire is known as the grandfather of critical pedagogy. His award-winning edition, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, was a combination of philosophical, political, and educational theory. Freire's education lessons were really an outline of a theory of oppression and a source of liberation. In his view, the key to liberation was the awakening of critical awareness and the thinking process in the individual. This was the equivalent to critical race theory of today. One villager asked Paulo how come the military rulers of Brazil had allowed him to teach this type of alphabetization to the Brazilian peasants. His response was that they did so until they realized what he was actually doing. He recounted that in one of his last sessions with the peasants, they wanted to hold a graduation ceremony and also to invite the Minister of Education in the military government. This was in the days of the military dictatorship in Brazil, also known as the Fifth Brazilian Republic. The dictatorship had been established in April 1964, after a coup d'etat by the Brazilian armed forces, with support from the United States government against the elected president, Jean Goulart. Well, as the story goes, the minister gave his chummy, encouraging remarks, adding that now that the peasants knew how to read, they will be able to read the Brazilian constitution. That, of course, is the one that he and his generals had just written to keep themselves in power. Peasant leader, God bless his heart, who was assigned to give the vote of thanks, politely corrected the minister by saying, now that we can read minister, we will be able to rewrite the Brazilian constitution. Well, my primary education was not revolutionary alphabetization. It was more in the mold of Sparrow's song. For the most part of my early childhood, I attended St. James the Less Anglican Primary School in Kitty. I would occasionally wonder whatever happened to St. James the Great. I can't say that any seed of rebellion or conformity was planted in me at this stage. I am not even sure that I had chosen the right mole model from among my teachers. My Aunt Olga, my mother's younger sister, taught at St. James the Less. She is in her 90s now, having migrated at the earliest opportunity to apply her teaching skills into retirement in London. A few years ago, I was reminiscing with her about my primary school childhood and mentioned that the teacher I remembered the most was Mr. LaRose. We called him Buddy L.A. Oh my God, Limbs, why would you remember the most scruffy, untidy member of our staff at that time? I am sure glad you didn't turn out like him. Well, so much for the formation of young minds in my day. High school, 1957 to 1962. High school was a different kettle of fish. Things started to look up at this stage, and I suspected that it had more to do with the political situation in BG than my formal lessons. I attended Central High School in Georgetown. In those days, if you couldn't win acceptance into one of the two government prestige schools, Bishop's High School for Girls and Queen's College for Boys, your parents had to pay for your secondary education. Of course, my sister went to BHS and my brother went to QC. For the rest of the nation's siblings, there was a sort of ethnic religious profile of the remaining good high schools. They comprised Indian Educational Trust College, Tutorial High School, which had mostly students of African origin, St. Stanislaus College, which was Catholic, then there was Central High School, which on the surface could have been categorized as the Chinese High School because its founder, Mr. J.C. Locke, was Chinese. However, given the political development at that time, its word-of-mouth profile was more the Communist High School. Chedi Jagan, who was first elected as Chief Minister in 1953, was later to be elected the first Premier of British Guiana from 1961 to 1964. By the time I hit Central High School in 1957, it was in the height of the Cold War 
and Jagan was being regarded as the next communist after Fidel Castro, likely to emerge in the Western Hemisphere. As students, we didn't witness any socialist indoctrination in our tutelage. Maybe we lacked what the other high schools had adopted, right-wing politicizing. We had sound dedicated teachers, Mr. Carter in geography, Rudy Luck in mathematics, Vice Principal Adams in French, and T. Anson Sanko in history. We would all remember Sanko for his writing of poetry, lines and rhymes. An obsession with words. Besides cultivating a fixation on the rivers of Guyana, I was also enamored by the way the Guyanese spoke. This obsession found its origin in Latin, my best subject in high school. I found Latin rhythmic to speak. If you spoke it loud with the necessary intonations, it was just like the current rap of today. Central High School's motto was expressed in Latin because we were taught Latin. Central High School's motto was Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. The Latin language did not always translate in the order in which the words were written. It allowed for some independent organization of the order of its words. So keen and intense was my interest in Latin in those days that I was able to recite verbatim many parts of the Latin Mass even though I was not a Roman Catholic. In principio erat verbum, take a deep breath, et verbum erat apod deum et deus erat verbum. Breathe again. Latin does teach us something about English. In English, we can play around with the word order only if we are writing poetry. Else, it is a convention that rules. Subject first followed by the verb and then by the object. In Latin, it was always a little riddle to find out the significance of the word order. English is now the global language for commerce and one in which its usage exceeds its native speakers. Similarly, although in Imperial Rome the more widely spoken language was Greek, Latin was the global language for administration and law. Now you may think that my obsession with word order in languages would have sparked an open desire to study languages. Not really. My interest remained at the periphery of literary use. I was, however, intrigued with how the intonation of our local patwa gave more meaning to what the speaker intended than the words themselves. There was a famous murder case in Beijing told us by T. Anson Sanko, in which one, Mr. Balgobin, was charged with killing his wife. In his summary, the Crown Prosecutor stated that Balgobin had actually admitted to his guilt when he said, A mi wife, mi fidam, mi killam. However, when Balgobin's counsel made his submission, he said that rendering the statement to be one of facts was a matter of interpretation and misunderstanding. What Mr. Balgamin really meant was, would he, who fed his wife and cared so much for her all these years, suddenly turn around and kill her? Balgamin's case was subsequently dismissed. Do not be mistaken, I was not interested in languages as such. I was only interested in how people use words, in phonology as the sound system of a language, lexicon as the vocabulary of the language, grammar as the understandable use of the language, and syntax as the proper arrangement of the words. Since so many of my fellow students were struggling to pass English at GC, the General Certificate of Education, then I figured that this could not be our native language. How could British examiners fail us in our own language? we create language. If English was not our mother tongue, then what exactly was our native language? I always wondered about this. Later on in life, while a student at Cornell University, our small Caribbean student group invited Miss Olive Lewin to give us a lecture on language in the English-speaking islands. Olive Lewin, ODOM 1927-2013, was a Jamaican author, social anthropologist, musicologist, and teacher. 
She's probably best known for her recorded anthologies of old Jamaican folk songs researched and collected over her lifetime. She explained how Jamaican Creole had borrowed words from languages other than English, like Maroon from Spanish, Pikni from Portuguese, and Unu, which is the plural form of the word you from the Igbo people. Her about the existence of a Creole language in Guyana, as I didn't recall growing up learning one. Her response startled me. She said that to study the Guyanese patois, she had to go into the East Indian communities where it was best preserved. Although the East Indians were freely speaking it, its syntax gave away its African origin. In this respect, the Guyanese patois shared a common origin with the patois in the French islands, Papiamento in the Dutch islands of Venezuela, Salamacan in Suriname, and Patwa in Jamaica. In all these language forms was how the user used the syntax to indicate the tense. Me da love, me na a love, me in a love were all expressing different time frames. Wow, was I feeling vindicated because I remembered the umpteen times I was rebuked for saying I does do this when all I was attempting to express was that sense of habituality in whatever I was doing and even at my age I still does do it so. It was as simple as that or at least it should have been. Why then all the scolding and corrections?